think about this as, as the big picture, a very high level overview of you know, what it is we're trying to accomplish in functional safety. Um, we've got, uh, let's say, three, three different pieces. We've got the safety life cycle, we've got different phases, and then we've got safety life cycle flow charts um, for each of our core standards. So first, we can think about a, a simple question and that really is gonna drive uh, the, the rest of the course. When does a machine need to be safe? Does it need to be safe when it's built? Does it need to be safe when we do a risk assessment on it? Um, does it need to be safe when we decide to add a safety function like a light curtain to it? Um, or does it need to be safe when we operate and maintain it? Um, and, and it may seem a little bit you know, silly to build out each of these steps um, because we can look at it and say, well, you know, of course we need to meet all of the above. We need to make sure that it is safe at all of the stages of the life cycle. But when we think back to some of those, you know, common myths, you know, they may stop here and say, hey, it was safe when it's built. Another company did a risk assessment on it. They added a safety function. We're good. You know, everything that we need to worry about for this machine has been covered. But if we don't continue that, if we don't achieve our safety at each of those stages, um, we're we're not going to meet our, our tolerable risk requirements and we're not going to meet our safety goal. So it's really important that we achieve it throughout the entire life cycle of the machine. And so we can think about our, our goal is to build safer systems with fewer problems. We could build more cost-effective systems that align our design targets with our risk. We can get rid of weak link designs that provide a lot of cost but don't do much in terms of risk reduction. Um, so something that was, was really common um, in the past, especially in the, the process industry, was you'd have you know two out of three transmitters. So you'd have three transmitters that were redundant. You'd go to a redundant safety PLC that was separate from your main PLC. And then you'd go to either the same solenoid or a different solenoid, but on the same ultimate control valve. So you've got all of this cost up front in your, you know, your sensors, your input and your logic, and then your output is not independent. It's part of your failure and you don't actually get any risk reduction. So we want to think about, you know, building effective systems and getting rid of those weak links from the design. Um, we want to have a, an overall, a, a global framework um, for our, a safe design for our systems that aligns with performance-based and prescriptive standards as needed um, and build that control and feedback loop so that we're continuously getting better where our safety activity is continually making forward progress and making improvements. And so each of the, the different life cycles that we'll look at has three main phases. Um, the first is the analysis phase. So how do we identify hazards, um, analyze the risk of those hazards, see, okay, how, how bad would it be, um, and help make decisions on what risk mitigation is required for that hazard. So we start with analysis, then we go to design and implementation. So actually designing our safety functions, um, making sure that they achieve the necessary safety, whether that's based on a SIL level or a PL, um, and then validating that the design as it's implemented it, it is fully meeting those requirements, that the software requirements have been met. Uh, that when we installed it on site, we didn't use different components or use a different version. Um, so that's part of the design and implementation phase. And then lastly, we've got operations and maintenance. So how do we make sure that the um, machine stays safe throughout facility operations? How do we make sure that our ongoing maintenance activities or adjustments to the machine um, stay safe and that we are looking at periodic testing and inspection or periodic replacement of the different components. And so for our standards, if we start with 61508 as the you know parent functional safety standard, um, you know it's got a, a formal life cycle approach that it applies to analysis that could be used by an end user consultant or EPC, for example, um, that talks about you know, general risk analysis steps. We've got, um, you know, design and implement. So we've got the specific 
um, safety integrity requirements. We've got the requirements for the uh, safety related software for, um, you know, safe failure fractions and diagnostic coverage and all of these different things to say, has it met its design requirements? And those can be used by, um, you know, the vendor, the integrator, or the end user, depending on who's doing the, the design um, and whether the designs for you know, an individual component or an overall system. Um, these these concepts for the design can be applied. Um, and then lastly, the operate and maintain um, goes to the end user and their responsibilities for maintaining the safety functions um, for you know, decommissioning and, and disposal, you know, modification and management of change. All of that you know, ultimately falls to the end user to me. If we look at IC62061, it has a, a similar safety life cycle um, where you start with information on the machine and how it's used. You use that as the basis for your risk assessment. Um, you go through and identify safety functions, specify the requirements. You've got your realize or your design and implement phase where you, you build the safety function, you test it, you make sure that it meets your um, SIL requirements. Um, and then for operations and maintenance, you look at the, you know, the information for use and, and the validation to make sure that it's ready to go. Um, one of the things that we'll note is the risk assessment methods used in both 62061 and ISO 13849 are, are based on ISO 12100. So we'll look at um, general risk assessment um, practices as something that you can apply, you know, whether you're using either standard. And then for the subsequent lifecycle activities for you know, determining the safety functions and the required SIL levels and, and the actual method for designing and verifying it, we'll then split up and go down what does the 62061 path look like versus what does the ISO 13849 path look like. Um, another thing that we will talk about is the machine safety standards tend to be a, a little bit weaker than some of the other standards on operations and maintenance. And there are a couple of assumptions that we'll look at in the different calculation models where you either assume no testing or you assume um, essentially perfect testing, um, whatever the test frequency is. So we'll, we'll talk about those assumptions and, and where sometimes those don't always set us up for success um, because it is important that we don't lose this operations and maintenance piece. And then the, the last thing I just wanna highlight here is management of functional safety is something critical that we have to apply throughout the entire life cycle. Um, and again, tackling the human elements, making sure that we have the awareness of the hazards that we're following the procedures um, is one of the key areas that is, is sometimes missed and is something that is so important to focus on. So we, we don't wanna miss this management piece of the, the functional safety life cycle. Um, then if we compare this to, um, ISO 13849, you know, we can start with the uh, analysis phase, which is going to be uh, predominantly based on ISO 12100. So again, following a, a similar approach where we determine the limits of the machine, we identify hazards, we estimate and evaluate the risk. Um, we pick which safeguards we are going to use to reduce the risk. You know, we start with, um, you know, uh, essentially elimination of hazards or mechanical guarding. Um, and then go through, you know, the the most effective safeguards from there. And we will look at the the hierarchy of controls and the, um, you know, kind of the preferred approach for safeguard implementation as part of our, um, you know, risk reduction strategy in part one of this course. Um, and then from there, um, we look at okay, if the risk has not been reduced enough, um, if there are, you know, other hazards or, or things that we require a safety related part of the control system. Then we go to the, the second half of the life cycle. Um, and this is now the um, 13849 based approach for the safety function design, verifying that it achieves your, your necessary performance level requirements, um, and then going through and, and doing the testing. Um, and again, um, we'll talk about the current focus, but this does not have as much emphasis on the maintenance phase. But again, think of this as a parallel process, another way of, of designing and, and looking to make sure that your safety function um, achieves your performance requirements. And so when we 
talk about the, the current focus. Um, you know, risk assessments for machine safety have become much more widely adopted, and a lot of times these are the, the starting point of the, the focus for organizations. So if a company is you know, not doing their own risk assessments, that's, that's the first piece. They, they're, you, you need to get there. You need to have um, that as, as a focus point. Um, from there, the, the actual nuts and bolts of the safety function design and the guarding, um, a lot of times that is done right now by the manufacturers and the system integrators, and the owner operators may not be familiar with those types of requirements or what needs to be done to, to keep them working properly. Um, and then when it comes to operations and maintenance, um, again, this is something that is often overlooked and really isn't emphasized um, in the machine safety standards as, as much as it is in, in some other functional safety standards. Um, and if we talk about the modeling assumptions for ISO 13849, those calculations are, are based on the assumption that the equipment is installed, you operate it without testing for 20 years, and then after 20 years, you rip it out and completely replace it. And there are a couple potential traps there, one being um, you miss out on the benefits that periodic testing could provide. Um, another being that uh, in many cases, after 20 years, the equipment is not replaced. Uh, we can think about some plants have been operating with limited changes since you know, the 80s or the 90s, and they don't have a, a PM schedule where once it hits 20 years, they go in and change their safety function. And you know, that may be in the, you know, the manufacturer you know, information for use. It may say, hey, after 20 years, this component needs to be replaced. Um, but too, too many times, you know, I'll go into a, a facility that's operating with things as I'm well operating well outside of their um, useful life, operating well outside of that 20 year range, um, and they're carrying unknown risk that they may not even realize. And so to make sure that we are meeting our risk management objectives, we need to take and apply the safety life cycle across all three of the phases. Okay, so let me just quickly summarize this section, um, but essentially our, our safety life cycle yeah, we look at our phases, the analysis phase, the design and implementation and operations slash maintenance, and we need to make sure that we are applying our functional safety, that we're applying our safety measures to the machine throughout the entire life. Um, because again, if we miss that, we could have things fall through the crack. We could have you know unknown and unmitigated risks that we're not handling. Um, and so we really need to uh, apply those measures throughout the entire life um, to make sure that we are consistent, to make sure that we're meeting our goals. Thank you.